The year is 2008. I've just graduated from college in Virginia, and before I ship off to Boston, the bar I've hung out at for seven years gives me this bowling shirt as a graduation gift. It still fits. More importantly, Reuters reports that same year that Americans have just crossed a milestone. For the first time, they're sending more text messages than phone calls. Some are still laboriously tapping them out on numeric keypads. Others are texting more easily but more expensively on Blackberries and Palm Trios. And right in between, manufacturers see an opportunity. What if they could cram a full keyboard into a phone without packing in all the complexity and cost of making a smartphone? I'm Michael Fisher. Join me for a look back at a category that's a lot more fun than it sounds. Let's revisit the messaging phones. As my European friends are no doubt already saying in the comments, yes, we Americans were very late to the texting boom. As far back as 2001, Nokia had figured out how to cram a full keyboard into a dumb phone at the low, low cost of, well, being the subject of a Bubba Sparks video. Yeah, the 5510 isn't like the phalanx of Finnish phones I featured in my last Nokia video, most of which looked like the products of a weekend-eating fun fungi. While this general design would eventually evolve into useful and even beloved weirdos like the 3300 and the N-Gage, at this stage it was just a bunch of tiny keys dumped onto either side of a monochrome LCD lifted right from the Nokia 3310. But the durability that made that phone legendary isn't anywhere to be found here. The creaks of this casing are just as loud as the clacks from the deeply unsatisfying keys. And according to reviews of the time, the backplate was notoriously easy to crack. Also, the phone wasn't just focused on messaging. Check out the hard key shortcuts to the FM radio and MP3 player down here, and you'll see it was also one of the first music phones. Interactive CD-ROM with 64 megabytes of onboard storage for your MP3s. Given those features, maybe this price tag of 500 euro or nearly $800 adjusted for inflation makes sense. Yeah, I know my Samsung 3500 didn't have these features in 2001. Still, coyote ugly, man. Let's move on. Now, this is the kind of communicator that gets you a commendation for original thinking. Jerry Rig Everything called 2002's Nokia 6800 the coolest phone he ever owned, and it's easy to see why. Cell phone in the streets, texter in the sheets. By 2004, the concept had matured into this Nokia 6820, an absolutely tiny phone compared to its predecessor. But just like that forerunner, it crammed a full QWERTY keyboard into that compact casing by hiding it with a hinge. Now, these keys are still kind of cramped by today's standards, with poor travel and only moderate feedback, but they were a huge improvement over the original. Also, while the 6800's design made me feel pretty smart, because I could see the gold contacts that would tell the software when the keyboard was stowed or deployed, the 6820's approach of building that switch into the hinge itself is much cleaner. Sure, the display was a postage stamp, and the camera wasn't great, given the kind of phones that would hit the scene just a year later, but with a concept this innovative and execution this tight, I can't help but adore the 6820. Don't agree? Hey, yeah, uh, it's my life. You can leave or get out. That enough period song references for you? Okay, then. Let's slide on over to the form factor that would come to define messaging phones, at least in the U.S., so the LG Rumor is probably the least interesting phone in this video. I probably wouldn't have even included it if it weren't for the fact that I owned it and it's the reason I made a Facebook account. So thanks for that, I guess. See, in 2007, even though Facebook was the new social spot, my stubborn self was still clinging to the carcass of MySpace talking to Tom until I bought this phone and discovered that one of the preloaded Java apps was Facebook. So I joined, and, you know, until everyone's racist old relatives showed up, it was a pretty cool place to be. But anyway, it wasn't the apps that kept me on the LG rumor, nor was it the durability, because I broke it very easily. It was how competently it executed its core function of making messaging easier. The numerics click, the slider snaps, the QWERTY clacks. I've never used a dumb phone before or since with a keyboard this satisfying. That's a sentiment apparently shared by the former owner of this phone, Megan, who loves Harry Potter. 
Also, I hope you got that social studies homework done, Emily. Mr. Feeney's a tough one. Yeah, I had to get this phone from eBay in this U.S. cellular trim because my Sprint model is long gone. But thanks to its micro SD slot, the photos from my old rumor remain in my archive. As you can see, by 2007 standards, this was a pretty okay 1.3 megapixel camera, and it made up for its lack of flash with color filters of, um, dubious usefulness. It was never my first choice of shooter at the time, but I'm glad I had it with me to snap this shot of my director Conrad grinding this sword for our production of Rashomon. Actual, real talk, we lost Conrad earlier this year, so I'm happy I was able to snap these at the time. The best camera is the one you've got on you, after all. Now, a slider is all well and good, but when you think about it, wouldn't two sliders be better? Enter the Matrix. No, not that one. No, not that one either. This Matrix is from Pantech. Oh, and this particular phone is on loan from Avi Greengard, president and lead analyst at Texponential, who's also been kind enough to lend me a lot of other artifacts for this series. Seriously, stay tuned. Anyway, just like the companies Helio Ocean and Pantech Duo, the Matrix stacks two sliders one atop the other, so your numeric keypad pops out in portrait and the QWERTY slides out in landscape. Now, this does make it a big ice cream sandwich of a phone. And while the Matrix was faster than the Rumor, thanks to its 3G connection, the Rumor was easier to use one-handed because the numpad was just always exposed. But the real bummer on the Matrix was the lack of space for the keys to depress. Plus, there's no room above the top key row, so your thumbs are always bumping up against the bottom of the screen. And the whole thing suffers from a combo common to the era, a glossy gel coat surface with a hollow plastic void beneath. Not exactly a pocket full of sunshine. All right, I admit, I rushed through that one so we could get to our final device. My personal favorite, certainly, but also one of the best sequels in mobile phone history. Samsung's alias phones were kind of like the clamshell version of the Pantech Matrix. Open the hinge one way and it's a phone, open it the other way and it's a texting machine. Now this is the Alias 2 of 2008. Yeah, it brought some spec bumps and it ported over some features from the first one. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's stop and talk about this. If you remember Microsoft Bob, this is very similar, where the idea is to make software less intimidating if it's presented in the context of something familiar. So you get this dorm room home screen with all your menu items laid out in a kind of skeuomorphism writ large. It's not something I could live with today. But back in 2008, if I were a Verizon customer, I'd have lapped up whatever dumb UI they were dishing out in exchange for this ultimate gadget of a keyboard. See, instead of just painting a bunch of numbers and letters on the keys like the first alias, the alias 2 made each of these rubber buttons transparent, and it stuck a tiny e-ink screen under each one. That meant they wouldn't just change function when you switched which mode you were using, they'd also change appearance. So in messaging mode, you'd get a full QWERTY keyboard, complete with arrow keys, and in phone mode, you had way more buttons than you needed. So in addition to the usual numerics and D-pad, Samsung gave you shortcuts to messaging, camera, Bluetooth, the alarm clock, tons of stuff. E-Ink is the same display tech that makes things like the Amazon Kindle possible. It only uses power when it changes state, so it's just perfect for this application. Now, the downside is it's tricky to use because all the keys have to be the same size and there's no way to feel out a difference between them. But the combination of the comfy, gummy finish, reminiscent of the Palm Centro, and the sheer geeky, gadgety goodness makes it impossible for me to really criticize. In fact, I coveted this phone so much that back in the days when BlackBerry press events were still a thing, I used to hound BlackBerry executives to build a Key 3 with an alias-style keypad with OLEDs instead of e-ink, you know, so they could change function or language on the fly, or even do some rainbow backlighting like Razer keyboards. That never happened, of course, and uh, the alias 2 fell victim to the same market forces that ultimately killed every other interesting dumb phone, the rise of the unremarkable slab smartphone. So even though the products featured in this episode of WinPhones Were Fun had more than their share of shortfalls, and we wouldn't really want to own any of them today, we can at least take a page from Fallout Boy and say, thanks for the memories, even though they weren't so great. Thanks again to my friend Avi Greengard, who's been covering tech even before phones were fun. Check out his free research reports on the mobile landscape at Texponential in the description. Thanks also to friend of the channel Martin for providing the Nokia devices seen in this video and my When Nokia Went Crazy episode. 
And if you're wondering where the Motorola Flipout and LG Voyager and other messaging phones I teased in the last episode are, well, be sure to subscribe to The Mr. Mobile on YouTube because this is not the last messaging phones episode I will produce. Until next time, thanks for watching, and if you can't stay home, then at least stay safe and wear a mask while you stay mobile, my friends.